Hello, and welcome to another compilation of Lovecraft stories. Now, hopefully this is of a length that you have time to drift to slumber, or at the very least not have to pick as many videos to watch for a bit. Now, this collection's theme is retribution. See, Lovecraft has a surprising number of stories showing characters getting what's coming to them. Now, the wrinkle in these is that the forces deciding these just desserts are sometimes a bit inscrutable. Like in this first story, The Moon Bog. By most human standards, this character had every right to do what he did. But there were forces far greater that had a previous claim on his land, and they certainly made their feelings clear. So, let us begin. Somewhere, to what remote and fearsome region I know not, Dennis Barry has gone. I was with him the last night he lived among men, and heard his screams when the thing came to him. But all the peasants and police in County Maith could never find him, or the others, though they searched long and far. And now I shudder when I hear the frogs piping in swamps, or see the moon in lonely places. See, I had known Dennis Barry well in America, where he had grown rich, and had congratulated him when he bought back the old castle by the bog at Sleepy Kildary. It was from Kildary that his father had come, and it was there that he wished to enjoy his wealth among ancestral scenes. Men of his blood had once ruled over Kildary and built and dwelt in the castle. But those days were very remote, so that for generations the castle had been empty and decaying. After he went to Ireland, Barry wrote me often and told me how under his care the grey castle was rising tower by tower to its ancient splendor how the ivy was climbing slowly over the restored walls as it had climbed so many centuries ago, and how the peasants blessed him for bringing back the old days with his gold from over the sea. But in time there came troubles, and the peasants ceased to bless him, and fled away instead as from a doom. And then he sent a letter and asked me to visit him, for he was lonely in the castle with no one to speak to save the new servants and laborers he had brought from the north. The bog was the cause of all of these troubles, as Barry told me the night I came to the castle. I had reached Kildary in the summer sunset, as the gold of the sky lighted the green of the hills and groves in the blue of the fog, where on a far islet a strange olden ruin glistened spectrally. That sunset was very beautiful, but the peasants at Ballyloo had warned me against it and said that Kildary had become accursed, so that I almost shuddered to see the high turrets of the castle gilded with fire. Barry's motor had met me at the Ballyloo station, for Kildary is off the railway. The villagers had shunned the car and driver from the north, but had whispered to me with pale faces when they saw I was going to Kildary. And that night, after our reunion, Barry told me why. The peasants had gone from Kildary because Dennis Barry was to drain the Great Bog. For all his love of Ireland, America had not left him untouched, and he hated the beautiful wasted space where peat might be cut and land opened up. The legends and superstitions of Kildary did not move him, and he laughed when the peasants first refused to help and then cursed him and went away to Ballyloo with their few belongings as they saw his determination. In their place he sent for laborers from the north, and when the servants left he replaced them likewise. But it was lonely among strangers, so Barry had asked me to come. When I heard the fears which had driven the people from Kildary, I laughed as loudly as my friend had laughed, for these fears were of the vaguest wildest and most absurd character. They had to do with some preposterous legend of the bog and of a grim guardian spirit that dwelt in the strange olden ruin on the far islet I had seen in the sunset. There were tales of dancing lights in the dark of the moon and of chill winds when the night was warm, of wraiths in white hovering over the waters, and of an imagined city of stone deep down below the swampy surface. 
but foremost among the weird fancies, and, an al and alone in its absolute unanimity, was that of the curse awaiting him who should dare to touch or drain the vast reddish morass. There were secrets, said the peasants, which must not be uncovered. Secrets that had lain hidden since the plague came to the children of Partholan in the fabulous years beyond history. In the Book of Invaders, it is told that these sons of the Greeks were all buried at Talek, but old men in Kildary said that one city was overlooked, save by its patron moon goddess, so that only the wooded hills buried it when the men of Nemed swept down from Scythia in their thirty ships. Such were the idle tales which had made the villagers leave Kildary, and when I heard them I did not wonder that Dennis Barry had refused to listen. He had, however, a great interest in antiquities, and proposed to explore the bog thoroughly when it was drained. The white ruins on the islet he had often visited, but though their age was plainly great and their contour very little like that of most ruins in Ireland, they were too dilapidated to tell the days of their glory. Now the work of drainage was ready to begin, and the laborers from the north were soon to strip the forbidden bog of its green moss and red heather, and kill the tiny shell-paved streamlets and quiet blue pools fringed with rushes. After Barry had told me these things, I was very drowsy, for the travels of the day had been wearying, and my host had talked late into the night. A manservant showed me to my room, which was in a remote tower overlooking the village and the plain at the edge of the bog, and the bog itself, so that I could see from my windows in the moonlight the silent roofs from which the peasants had fled, and which now sheltered the laborers from the north, and two, the parish church with its antique spire, and far out across the brooding bog the remote olden ruin on the islet gleaming white and spectral. Just as I dropped to sleep, I fancied I heard faint sounds from the distance, sounds that were wild and half musical and stirred me with a weird excitement which colored my dreams but when i awaked next morning i felt it had all been a dream for the visions i had seen were more wonderful than any sound of wild pipes in the night influenced by the legends that barry had related my mind had in slumber hovered around a stately city in a green valley where marble streets and statues villas and temples carvings and inscriptions all spoke in certain tones the glory that was greece when i told this dream to barry we both laughed but i laughed the louder because he was perplexed about his laborers from the north for the sixth time they had all overslept waking very slowly and dazedly, and acting as if they had not rested, although they were known to have gone early to bed the night before. That morning and afternoon I wandered alone through the sun-gilded village and talked now and then with idle laborers, for Barry was busy with the final plans for beginning his work of drainage. The laborers were not as happy as they might, not, they might have been, for most of them seemed uneasy over some dream which they had had, yet which they tried in vain to remember. I told them of my dream, but they were not interested till I spoke of the weird sounds I thought I had heard. Then they looked oddly at me and said that they seemed to remember weird sounds too. In the evening, Barry dined with me and announced that he would begin the drainage in two days. I was glad, for although I disliked to see the moss and the heather and the little streams and lakes depart, I had a growing wish to discern the ancient secrets the deep matted peat might hide. And that night my dreams of piping flutes and marble peristyles came to a sudden and disquieting end. For upon the city in the valley I saw a pestilence descend, and then a frightful avalanche of wooded slopes that covered the dead bodies in the streets, and left unburied only the temple of Artemis on the high peak, where the aged moon priestess Clace lay cold and silent, with a crown of ivory on her silver head. I have said that I awaked suddenly and in alarm. For some time I could not tell whether I was waking or sleeping, for the sound of flutes still rang shrilly in my ears. But when I saw 
on the floor the icy moonbeams and the outlines of a latticed gothic window, I decided I must be awake and in the castle at Kildary. Then I heard a clock from some remote landing below strike the hour of two, and I knew I was awake. Yet still there came the monotonous piping from afar, wild, weird airs that made me think of some dance of fawns on distant Manalus. It would not let me sleep, and in impatience I sprang up and paced the floor. Only by chance did I go to the north window and look out upon the silent village and the plain at the edge of the bog. I had no wish to gaze abroad, for I wanted to sleep, but the flutes tormented me, and I had to do or see something. How could I have suspected the thing I was to behold? There in the moonlight that flooded the spacious plain was a, spectac a spectacle which no mortal, having seen it, could ever forget. To the sound of reedy pipes that echoed over the bog, there glided silently and eerily a mixed throng of swaying figures, reeling through such a revel as the Sicilians may have danced to Demeter in the old days under the harvest moon beside the Cyane. The wide plain, the golden moonlight, the shadowy moving forms, and above all, the shrill monotonous piping produced an effect which almost paralyzed me. Yet I noted amidst my fear that half of these tireless mechanical dancers were the laborers whom I had thought asleep, whilst the other half were strange airy beings in white, half indeterminate in nature, but suggesting pale, wistful naiads from the haunted fountains of the bog. I do not know how long I gazed at this sight from the lonely turret window before I dropped suddenly in a dreamless swoon, out of which the high sun of morning aroused me. My first impulse on awakening was to communicate all my fears and observations to Dennis Barry. But as I saw the sunlight glowing through the latticed east window, I became sure that there was no reality in what I thought I had seen. I am given to strange phantasms, yet am never weak enough to believe in them. So on this occasion, contented myself with questioning the labors, who slept very late and recalled nothing of the previous night save misty dreams of shrill sounds. This matter of the spectral piping harassed me greatly, and I wondered if the crickets of autumn had come before their time to vex the night and haunt the visions of men. Later in the day, I watched Barry in the library poring over his plans for the great work which was to begin on the morrow, and for the first time felt a touch of the same kind of fear that had driven the peasants away. For some unknown reason, I dreaded the thought of disturbing the ancient bog and its sunless secrets, and pictured terrible sights lying black under the unmeasured depth of age-old peat. That these secrets should be brought to light seemed injudicious, and I began to wish for an excuse to leave the castle and the village. I went so far as to talk casually to Barry on the subject, but did not dare continue after he gave his resounding laugh. So I was silent when the sun set fulgently over the far hills, and Kildary blazed all red and gold in a flame that seemed a portent. Whether the events of that night were of reality or illusion, I shall never ascertain. Certainly, they transcend anything we dream of in nature and the universe, yet in no normal fashion can I explain those disappearances which were known to all men after it was over. I retired early and full of dread, and for a long time could not sleep in the uncanny silence of the tower. It was very dark, for although the sky was clear, the moon was now well in the wane, and would not rise till the small hours. I thought as I lay there of Dennis Berry, and of what would befall that bog when the day came, and found myself almost frantic with an impulse to rush out into the night, take Barry's car, and drive madly to Ballyloo out of the menaced lands. But before my fears could crystallize into action, I had fallen asleep and gazed in dreams upon that city in the valley, cold and dead under a shroud of hideous shadow. 
Probably it was the shrill piping that awaked me. Yet that piping was not what I noticed first when I opened my eyes. I was laying with my back to the east window overlooking the bog where the waning moon would rise and therefore expected to see a light cast on the opposite wall before me. But I had not looked for such a sight as now appeared. Light indeed glowed on the panels ahead, but it was not any light that the moon gives. Terrible and piercing was the shaft of ruddy refulgence that streamed through the gothic window, and the whole chamber was brilliant with a splendor intense and unearthly. My immediate actions were peculiar for such a situation, but it is only in tales that a man does the dramatic and foreseen thing. Instead of looking out across the bog toward the source of the new light, I kept my eyes from the window in panic fear and clumsily drew on my clothing with some dazed idea of escape. I remember seizing my revolver and hat, but before it was over I had lost them both without firing the one or donning the other. After a time, the fascination of the red radiance overcame my fright, and I crept to the east window and looked out whilst the maddening incessant piping whined and reverberated through the castle and over all the village. Over the bog was a deluge of flaring light, scarlet and sinister, and pouring from the strange olden ruin on the far islet. The aspect of that ruin I cannot describe. I must have been mad, for it seemed to rise majestic and undecayed, splendid and column cinctured, the flame reflecting marble of its entablature piercing the sky like the apex of a temple on a mountaintop. Flutes shrieked and drums began to beat, and as I watched in awe and terror, I thought I saw dark saltant forms silhouetted grotesquely against the vision of marble and effulgence. The effect was titanic, altogether unthinkable, and I might have stared indefinitely had not the sound of the piping seemed to grow stronger at my left. Trembling with a terror, oddly mixed with ecstasy, I crossed the circular room to the north window from which I could see the village and the plain at the edge of the bog. There, my eyes dilated again with a wild wonder as great as if I had not just turned from a scene beyond the pale of nature. For on the ghastly red litten plain was moving a procession of beings in such a manner as none ever saw before, save in nightmares. Half gliding, half floating in the air, the white-clad bog wraiths were slowly retreating toward the still waters and the island ruin in fantastic formations, suggesting some ancient and solemn ceremonial dance. Their waving, translucent arms, guided by the detestable piping of those unseen flutes, beckoned in uncanny rhythm to a throng of lurching laborers who followed dog-like with blind, brainless, floundering steps as if dragged by a clumsy but resistless demon will. As the naiads neared the bog without altering their course, a new line of stumbling stragglers zigzagged drunkenly out of the castle from some door far below my window, groped sightlessly across the courtyard and through the intervening bit of village, and joined the floundering column of laborers on the plain. Despite their distance below me, I at once knew they were the servants brought from the north, for I recognized the ugly and unwieldy form of the cook, whose very absurdness had now become unutterably tragic. The flutes piped horribly, and again I heard the beating of the drums from the direction of the island ruin. Then silently and gracefully, the naiads reached the water and melted one by one into the ancient bog, while the line of followers, never checking their speed, splashed awkwardly after them and vanished amidst a tiny vortex of unwholesome bubbles which I could barely see in the scarlet light. And as the last pathetic straggler, the fat cook, sank heavily out of sight in that sullen pool. The flutes and the drums grew silent. 
and the blinding red rays from the ruins snapped instantaneously out, leaving the village of doom lone and desolate in the wan beams of a new risen moon. My condition was now one of indescribable chaos. Not knowing whether I was mad or sane, sleeping or waking, I was saved only by a merciful numbness. I believe I did ridiculous things, such as offering prayers to Artemis, Latona, Demeter, Persephone, and Pluton. All that I recalled of a classic youth came to my lips as the horrors of the situation roused my deepest superstitions. I felt that I had witnessed the death of a whole village, and knew I was alone in the castle with Dennis Berry, whose boldness had brought down a doom. As I thought of him, new terrors convulsed me, and I fell to the floor, not fainting, but physically helpless. Then I felt the icy blast from the east window where the moon had risen, and began to hear the shrieks in the castle far below me. Soon those shrieks had attained a magnitude and quality which cannot be written of, and which make me faint as I think of them. All I can say is that they came from something I had known as a friend. At some time during this shocking period, the cold wind and the screaming must have roused me, for my next impression is of racing madly through the inky rooms and corridors and out across the courtyard into the hideous night. They found me at dawn, wandering mindless near Ballyloo, but what unhinged me utterly was not any of the horrors I had seen or heard before. What I muttered about as I came slowly out of the shadows was a pair of fantastic incidents which occurred in my flight. Incidents of no significance, yet which haunt me unceasingly when I am alone in certain marshy places or in the moonlight. As I fled from that accursed castle along the bog's edge, I heard a new sound, common, yet unlike any I had heard before at Kildary. The stagnant waters, lately quite devoid of animal life now teemed with a horde of slimy, enormous frogs which piped shrilly and incessantly in tones strangely out of keeping with their size. They glistened bloated and green in the moonbeams and seemed to gaze up at the fount of light. I followed the gaze of one very fat and ugly frog, and saw the second of the things which drove my senses away. Stretching directly from the strange olden ruin on the far islet to the waning moon, my eyes seemed to trace a beam of faint quivering radiance having no reflection in the waters of the bog, and upward along that pallid path my fevered fancy pictured a thin shadow slowly writhing, a vague, contorted shadow struggling as if drawn by unseen demons. Crazed as I was, I saw in that awful shadow a monstrous resemblance, a nauseous, unbelievable caricature, a blasphemous effigy of him who had been Dennis Berry. Thus concludes The Moon Bog. Now this next story is pretty morally clear on the retribution, but was so subtle in its telling that Lovecraft actually had to explain it after the fact. The ending was in fact an act of retribution. Now keep that in mind as we proceed to read The Tree. On a verdant slope of Mount Manolis in Arcadia, there stands an olive grove about the ruins of a villa. Close by is a tomb, once beautiful with the sublimest sculptures, but now fallen into as great decay as the house. At one end of that tomb, its curious roots displacing the time-stained blocks of pentelic marble, grows an unnaturally large olive tree oddly repellent shape, so like to some grotesque man or death-distorted body of a man, 
that the country folk fear to pass it at night when the moon shines faintly through the crooked boughs. Mount Manalus is a chosen haunt of dreaded Pan, whose queer companions are many, and simple swains believe that the tree must have some hideous kinship to these weird Panisky, but an old beekeeper who lives in the neighboring cottage told me a different story. Many years ago, when the hillside villa was new and resplendent, there dwelt within it the two sculptors, Kalos and Musides. From Lydia to Neapolis, the beauty of their work was praised, and none dared say that the one excelled the other in skill. The Hermes of Kalos stood in a marble shrine in Corinth, and the palace of Musides surmounted a pillar in Athens, near the Parthenon. All men paid homage to Kalos and Musides, and marveled that no shadow of artistic jealousy cooled the warmth of their brotherly friendship. But though Kalos and Musides dwelt in unbroken harmony, their natures were not alike. Whilst Musides reveled by night amidst the urban gaieties of Tegea, Kalos would remain at home, stealing away from the sight of his slaves into the cool recesses of the olive grove. There he would meditate upon the visions that filled his mind, and there devise the forms of beauty which later became immortal in breathing marble. Idle folk indeed said that Kalos conversed with the spirits of the grove, and that his statues were but images of the fauns and dryads he met there, for he patterned his work after no living model. So famous were Kalos and Musides that none would none wondered when the tyrant of Syracuse sent to them deputies to speak of the costly stash, statue of Tish, which he had planned for his city. Of great size and cunning worksmanship must the statue be, for it was to form a wonder of nations and a goal of travelers. Exalted beyond thought would be he whose work should gain acceptance, and for this honor Kalos and Musides were invited to compete. Their brotherly love was well known, and the crafty tyrant surmised that each, instead of concealing his work from the other, would offer aid and advice, this charity producing two images of unheard-of beauty, the lovelier of which would eclipse even the dreams of poets. With joy, the sculptors hailed the tyrant's offer, so that in the days that followed, their slaves heard the ceaseless blows of chisels. Not from each other did Callus and Musides conceal their work, but the sight was for them alone. Saving theirs, no eyes beheld the two divine figures released by skillful blows from the rough blocks that had imprisoned them since the world began. At night, as of yore, Mus Musides sought the banquet halls of Tegea whilst Callus wandered alone in the olive grove. But as time passed, men observed a want of gaiety in the once sparkling Musides. It was strange, they said amongst themselves, that depression should thus seize one with so great a chance to win art's loftiest reward. Many months passed, yet in the sour face of Musides came nothing of the sharp expectancy which the situation should arouse. Then, one day, Musides spoke of the illness of Kalos, after which none marveled again at his sadness. Since the sculptor's attachment was known to be deep and sacred, subsequently many went to visit Callus and indeed noticed the pallor of his face. But there was about him a happy serenity which made his glance more magical than the glance of Musides, who was clearly distracted with anxiety, and who pushed aside all the slaves in his eagerness to feed and wait upon his friend with his own hands. Hidden behind heavy curtains stood the two unfinished figures of Tish, little touched of late by the sick man and his faithful attendant. As Callus grew inexplicably weaker and weaker, despite the ministrations of puzzled physicians and of his assiduous friend, he desired to be carried often to the grove which he so loved. There he would ask to be left alone, as if wishing to speak with unseen things. Musides ever granted his requests, though his eyes filled with visible tears at the thought that Kalos should care more for the fauns and the dryads than for him. At last, the end drew near. 
and Callus discoursed of things beyond this life. Musides, weeping, promised him a sepulchre, a sepulchre more lovely than the tomb of Mus Mausolus. But Callus bade him speak no more of marble glories. Only one wish now haunted the mind of the dying man, that twigs from certain olive trees in the grove be buried by his resting place close to his head. And one night, sitting alone in the darkness of the olive grove, Callus died. Beautiful beyond words was the marble sepulchre which stricken Musides carved for his beloved friend. None but Callus himself could have fashioned such bas reliefs, wherein were displayed all the splendors of Elysium. Nor did Musides fail to bury close to Callus' head the olive twigs from the grove. As the first violence of Musides' grief gave place to resignation, he labored with diligence upon his figure of Tish. All honor was now his, since the tyrant of Syracuse would have the work of none save him or Callus. His task proved a vent for his emotion, and he toiled more steadily each day, shunning the gaieties he once had relished. Meanwhile, his evenings were spent beside the tomb of his friend, where a young olive tree had sprung up near the sleeper's head. So swift was the gross growth of this tree, and so strange was its form, that all who beheld it exclaimed in surprise, and Musides seemed at once fascinated and repelled. Three years after the death of Callus, Musides dispatched a messenger to the tyrant, and it was whispered in the Agora at Tegea that the mighty statue was finished. By this time, the tree by the tomb had attained amazing proportions, exceeding all other trees of its kind, and sending out a singularly heavy branch above the apartment in which Musides labored. As many visitors came to view the prodigious tree as to admire the art of the sculptor, so that Musides was seldom alone. But he did not mind his multitude of guests. Indeed, he seemed to, to dread being alone now that his absorbing work was done. The bleak mountain wind sighing through the olive grove and the tomb tree had an uncanny way of forming vaguely articulate sounds. The sky was dark on the evening that the tyrant's emissaries came to Tegea. It was definitely known that they had come to bear away the great image of Tish and bring eternal honor to Musides, so their reception by the Proxenoi was of great warmth. As the night wore on, a violent storm of wind broke over the crest of Manolus, and the men from far Syracuse were glad that they rested snugly in the town. They talked of their illustrious tyrant and of the splendor of his capital and exulted in the glory of the statue which Musides had wrought for them. And then the men of Tegea spoke of the goodness of Musides and of his heavy grief for his friend and how not even the coming laurels of art could console him in the absence of Callus, who might have worn those laurels instead. Of the tree which grew by the tomb near the head of Callus, they also spoke. The wind shrieked more horribly, and both the Syracusans and the Arcadians prayed to Iolos. In the sunshine of the morning, the Proxenoi led the tyrant's messengers up the slope to the abode of the sculptor. But the night wind had done strange things. Slaves' cries ascended from the scene of desolation, and no more amidst the olive grove rose the gleaming colonnades of that vast hall wherein Musides had dreamed and toiled. Lone and shaken mourned the humble courts and the lower walls, for upon the sumptuous great peristyle had fallen squarely the heavy overhanging bough of the strange new tree reducing the stately poem in marble with odd completeness to a mound of unsightly ruins. Strangers and Tegeans stood aghast, looking from the wreckage to the great sinister tree whose aspect was so weirdly human, whose roots reached so queerly into the sculptured sepulcher of Kalos, and their fear and dismay increased when they searched the fallen apartment for of the gentle Musides, and of the marvelously fashioned image of Tish, no trace could be discovered. 
Amidst such stupendous ruin, only chaos dwelt, and the representatives of two cities left disappointed. Syracusans, that they had no statue to bear home, to Gians, that they had no artist to crown. However, the Syracusans obtained after a while a very splendid statue in Athens, and the Tegeans consoled themselves by erecting in the Agora a marble temple commemorating the gifts, virtues, and brotherly piety of Musides. But the olive grove still stands, as does the tree growing out of the tomb of Kalos. And the old beekeeper told me that sometimes the boughs whisper to one another in the night wind, saying over and over again, Oida, Oida, I know, I know. Thus concludes the tree. Not every bit of retribution is meted out in such a timely fashion as these previous stories. When dealing with forces on a more cosmic level, the timeline for justice can be extended into generations, which is exactly what happens in this next story, The Doom That Came to Sarnath. There is in the land of Minar a vast still lake that is fed by no stream and out of which no stream flows. Ten thousand years ago, there stood by its shore the mighty city of Sarnath, but Sarnath stands there no more. It is told that in the immemorial years when the world was young, before ever the men of Sarnath came to the land of Minar, another city stood beside the lake, the grey stone city of Ib, which was old as the lake itself and peopled with beings not pleasing to behold. Very odd and ugly were these beings, as indeed are most beings of a world yet inquit and rudely fashioned. It is written on the brick cylinders of Catatharin that the beings of Ib were in hue as green as the lake and the mists that rise above it, that they had bulging eyes, pouting flabby lips and curious ears, and were without voice. It is also written that they descended one night from the moon in a mist, they in the vast still lake and grey stone city of Ib. However this may be, it is certain that they worshipped a sea-green stone idol chiseled in the likeness of Bokrug, the great water lizard, before which they danced horribly when the moon was gibbous, and it is written in the papyrus of Ilernek that they one day discovered fire and thereafter kindled flames on many ceremonial occasions. But not much is written of these beings, because they lived in very ancient times, and man is young and knows little of the very ancient living things. After many aeons, men came to the land of Minar, dark shepherd folk with their fleecy flocks who built Thra, Ilernek, and Catatharin on the winding river Ai. And certain tribes, more hardy than the rest, pushed on to the border of the lake and built Sarnath at a spot where precious metals were found in the earth. Not far from the great city of Ib did the wandering tribes lay the first stones of Sarnath, and at the beings of Ib they marveled greatly. But with their marveling was mixed hate, for they thought it not meet that beings of such aspect should walk about the world of men at dusk, nor did they like the strange sculptures upon the grey monoliths of Ib, for those sculptures were terrible with great antiquity. Why the beings in the sculptures lingered so late in the world, even until the coming of men, none can tell, unless it was because the land of Minar is very still and remote from most other lands, both of waking and of dream. As the men of Sarnath beheld more of the beings of Ib, their hate grew. And it was not less because they found the beings weak and soft as jelly to the touch of stones and spears and arrows. So one day the young warriors, the slingers and the spearmen and the bowmen, marched against Ib and slew all the inhabitants thereof, pushing the queer bodies into the lake with long spears because they did not wish to touch them. 
Because they did not like the gray sculptured monoliths of Ib, they cast these also into the lake. Wondering from the greatness of the labor, however the stones were brought from afar, as they must have been, since there is not like them in all the land of Minar, or in the lands adjacent. Thus, of the very ancient city of Ib was nothing spared, save the sea-green stone idol, chiseled in the likeness of Bakrug, the water lizard. This the young warriors took back with them to Sarnath as a symbol of conquest over the old gods and beings of Ib, and a sign of leadership in Minar. But on the night after it was set up in the temple, a terrible thing must have happened, for weird lights were seen over the lake, and in the morning the people found the idol gone, and the high priest Taranish lying dead as from some fear unspeakable. And before he died, Taranish had scrawled upon the altar of chrysolite, and with coarse, shaky strokes, the sign of doom. After Taranish, there were many high priests in Sarnath, but never was the sea green stone idol found, and many centuries came and went, wherein Sarnath prospered exceedingly, so that only priests and old women remembered what Taran Ish had scrawled upon the altar of Chrysalit. Betwixt Sarnath and the city of Ilarnek arose a caravan route. The precious metals from the earth were exchanged for other metals, and rare cloths, and jewels, and books, and tools for artificers, and all things of luxury that are known to the people who dwell along the winding river I and beyond. So Sarnath waxed mighty and learned and beautiful and sent forth conquering armies to subdue the neighboring cities. And in time, there sate upon a throne in Sarnath the kings of all the land of Minar and of many lands adjacent. The wonder of the world and the pride of all mankind was Sarnath the Magnificent. Of polished desert quarried marble were its walls in height 300 cubits, and in breadth 75, so that chariots might pass each other as men drave them along the top. For full 500 stadia did they run, being open only on the side toward the lake, where a green stone seawall kept back the waves that rose oddly once a year at the festival of the destroying of Ib. In Sarnath were 50 streets from the lake to the gates of the caravans, and 50 more intersecting them. With onyx were they paved, save those were on the horses and camels and elephants trod, which were paved with granite. And the gates of Sarnath were as many as the landward ends of the streets, each of bronze, and flanked by the figures of lions and elephants carven from some stone no longer known among men. The houses of Sarnath were of glazed brick and chalcedony, each having its walled garden and crystal lakelet. With strange art were they builded, for no other city had houses like them, and travelers from Thra and Elernek and Katatharin marveled at the shining domes wherewith they were surmounted. But more marvelous still were the palaces and the temples and the gardens made by Zakhar, the olden king. There were many palaces, the least of which were mightier than any in Thra or Elernek or Katatharin. So high were they that one within might sometimes fancy himself beneath only the sky. Yet when lighted with torches dipped in the oil of Dothar, their walls showed vast paintings of kings and armies, of a splendor at once inspiring and stupefying to the beholder. Many were the pillars of the palaces, all of tinted marble and carven into designs of surpassing beauty. And in most of the palaces, the floors were mosaics of beryl and lapis lazuli, and sardonyx and carbuncle and other choice materials, so disposed that the beholder might fancy himself walking over beds of the rarest flowers. And there were likewise fountains, which cast scented waters about in pleasing jets arranged with cunning art. Outshining all others was the palace of the kings of Minar and the lands adjacent. On a pair of golden crouching lions rested the throne, many steps above the gleaming floor, and it was wrought of one piece of ivory, though no man lives who knows whence so vast a piece could have come. 
In that palace, there were also many galleries and many amphitheaters where lions and men and elephants battled at the pleasure of the kings. Sometimes the amphitheaters were flooded with water conveyed from the lake in mighty aqueducts, and then were enacted stirring sea fights or combats betwixt swimmers and deadly marine things. Lofty and amazing were the seventeen tower-like temples of Sarnath, fashioned of a bright, multicolored stone not known elsewhere. A full thousand cubits high stood the greatest among them, wherein the high priests dwelt with a magnificence scarce less than that of the kings. On the ground were halls as vast and splendid as those of the palaces, where gathered throngs in worship of Zo Kalar and Tamash and Loban, the chief gods of Sarnath whose incense enveloped shrines were as the thrones of monarchs. Not like the acons of other gods were those of Zo Kalar and Tamash and Loban, for so close to life were they that one might swear the graceful bearded gods themselves sate on the ivory thrones. And up unending steps of shining zircon was the tower chamber, where from the high priests looked out over the city and the plains and the lake by day, and at the cryptic moon, and significant stars and planets, and their reflections in the lake by night. Here was done the very secret and ancient rite in detestation of Bokrug, the water lizard, and here rested the altar of Chrysalit, which bore the doom scrawl of Taran Ish. Wonderful likewise were the gardens made by Zokar, the olden king, in the center of Sarnath they lay, covering a great space and encircled by a high wall. They were surmounted by a mighty dome of glass, through which shone the sun and moon and stars and planets when it was clear, and from which were hung fulgent images of the sun and moon and stars and planets when it was not clear. In the summer, the gardens were cooled with fresh odorous breezes skillfully wafted by fans, and winter they were heated with concealed fires, so that in those gardens it was always spring. There ran little streams over bright pebbles, dividing meds of green and gardens of many hues, and spanned by a multitude of bridges. Many were the waterfalls in their courses, and many were the lily lakelets into which they expanded. Over the streams and lakelets rode white swans, whilst the music of rare birds chimed in with the melody of the waters. In ordered terraces rose the green banks, adorned here and there with bowers of vines and sweet blossoms, and seats and benches of marble and porphyry. And there were many small shrines and temples where one might rest or pray to small gods. Each year, there was celebrated in Sarnath the Feast of the Destroying of Ib, at which time wine, song, dancing, and merriment of every kind abounded. Great honors were then paid to the shades of those who had annihilated the odd ancient beings, and the memory of those beings and of their elder gods was derided by dancers and lutenists crowned with roses from the gardens of Zakhar. And the kings would look out over the lake and curse the bones of the dead that lay beneath it. At first, the high priests liked not these festivals, for there had descended amongst them queer tales of how the sea green Akon had vanished and how Taran Ish had died from fear and left a warning. And they said that from their high tower they sometimes saw lights beneath the waters of the lake. But as many years passed without calamity, even the priests laughed and cursed and joined in the orgies of the feasters. Indeed, had they not themselves in their high tower often performed the very ancient and secret rite and detestation of Bokrug the water lizard? A thousand years of riches and delight passed over Sarnath, wonder of the world and pride of all mankind. Gorgeous beyond thought was the feast of the thousandth year of the destroying of Ib. For a decade had it been talked of in the land of Minar, and as it drew nigh there came to Sarnath, on horses and camels and elephants, men from Thra, Ilernek, and Katatharin, and all the cities of Nar and the lands beyond. 
before the marble walls on the appointed night were pitched the pavilion of princes and the tents of travelers, and all the shore resounded with the song of happy revelers. Within his banquet hall reclo- reclined Nargis Hay, the king, drunken with ancient wine from the vaults of conquered Panath, and surrounded by feasting nobles and hurrying slaves. There were eaten many strange delicacies at that feast, peacocks from the isles of Nereal and the Middle Ocean, young goats from the distant hills of Implen, heels of camels from the Benezic deserts, nuts and spices from Sidathrian groves, and pearls from wave-wash metal dissolved in the vinegar of Thrall. Of sauces there were an untold number, prepared by the subtlest cooks in all of Minar, and suited to the palate of every feaster. But most prized of all the viands were the great fishes from the lake, each of vast size, and served up on golden platters set with rubies and diamonds. Whilst the king and his nobles feasted within the palace and viewed the crowning dish as it awaited them on golden platters, others feasted elsewhere. In the tower of the great temple, the priests held revels, and in pavilions without the walls, the princes of neighboring lands made merry. It was the high priest Nai Ka who first saw the shadows that descended from the gibbous moon into the lake, and the damnable green mists that arose from the lake to meet the moon and to shroud in a sinister haze the towers and the domes of faded Sarna. Thereafter, those in the towers and without the walls beheld strange lights on the water and saw that the gray rock Acurian, which was wont to rear high above near the shore, was almost submerged. And fear grew vaguely, yet swiftly, so that the princes of Ilernek and of Far Recall took down and folded their tents and pavilions and departed for the river Eye, though they scarce knew the reason for their departing. Then, close to the hour of midnight, all the bronze gates of Sarnath burst open and emptied forth a frenzied throng that blackened the plain so that all the visiting princes and travelers fled away in fright. For on the faces of this throng was writ a madness born of horror unendurable, and on their tongues were words so terrible that no hearer paused for proof. Men whose eyes were wild with fear shrieked aloud of the sight within the king's banquet hall, where through the windows were seen no longer the forms of Nargis Hay and his nobles and slaves, but a horde of indescribable green, voiceless things with bulging eyes, pouting flabby lips, and curious ears, things which danced horribly, bearing in their paws golden platters set with rubies and diamonds containing uncouth flames. And the princes and travelers, as they fled from the doomed city of Sarnath on horses and camels and elephants, looked again upon the mist-begetting lake and saw the gray rock Acurian was quite submerged. Through all the land of Minar and the lands adjacent spread the tales of those who had fled from Sarnath and caravans sought that accursed city and its precious metals no more. It was long ere any traveler went thither, and even then only the brave and adventurous young men of distant Falona dared make the journey, adventurous young men of yellow hair and blue eyes who are no kin to the men of Minar. These men indeed went to the lake to view Sarnath, but they though they found the vast still lake itself and the gray rock Acurian which rears high above it near the shore, they beheld not the wonder of the world and pride of all mankind, for once had risen walls of three hundred cubits and towers yet higher, now stretched only the marshy shore. And where once had dwelt fifty millions of men, now crawled only the detestable green water lizard. Not even the mines of precious metal remained, for doom had come to Sarnath. But half buried in the rushes was spied 
a curious green idol of stone, an exceedingly ancient idol, coated with seaweed and chiseled in the likeness of Bokrug, the great water lizard. That idol, enshrined in the high temple at Ilarnek, was subsequently worshipped beneath the gibbous moon throughout the land of Menar. Thus concludes the doom that came to Sarnath. There are times when all it takes to catch the ire of these mighty forces is arrogance. Now this may seem unfair, but consider how harshly you may have reacted to the hubris of a lesser being. Perhaps a haughty insect sauntering across your kitchen counter? Let's see how it's handled in The Other Gods. Atop the tallest of Earth's peaks dwell the gods of Earth, and suffer no man to tell that he hath looked upon them. Lesser peaks they once inhabited, but ever the men from the plains would scale the slopes of rock and snow, driving the gods to higher and higher mountains, till now only the last remains. When they left their older peaks, they took with them all signs of themselves, save once. It is said when they left a carven image on the face of the mountain, which they called Nogranek. But now they, were, they have betaken themselves to unknown Kadath, in the cold waste where no man treads, and are grown stern, having no higher peak whereto to flee at the coming of men. They are grown stern, and where once they suffered men to displace them, they now forbid men to come, or coming to depart. It is well for men that they know not of Kadath in the cold waste, else they would seek injudiciously to scale it. Sometimes, when Earth's gods are homesick, they visit in the still night the peaks where once they dwelt, and weep softly as they try to play in the olden way on remembered slopes. Men have felt the tears of the gods on white-capped Thurai, though they have thought it rain, and have heard the sighs of the gods in the plaintive dawn winds of Lyrian. In cloud ships the gods are wont to travel, and wise cotters have legends that keep them from certain high peaks at night when it is cloudy, for the gods are not lenient as of old. In Ulthar, which lies beyond the river Sky, once dwelt an old man, avid to behold the gods of Earth, a man deeply learned in the seven cryptical books of Hassan, and familiar with the Nakatic manuscripts of distant and frozen Lomar. His name was Barzai the Wise, and the villagers tell of how he went up on he went up a mountain on the night of the strange eclipse. Barzai knew so much of the gods that he could tell of their comings and goings, and guessed so many of their secrets that he was deemed half a god himself. It was he who wisely advised the Burgesses of Ulthar when they passed their remarkable law against the slaying of cats, and who first told the young priest Atal where it is that black cats go at midnight on St. John's Eve. Barzai was learned in the lore of Earth's gods, and had gained a desire to look upon their faces. He believed that his great secret knowledge of gods could shield him from their wrath, so resolved to go up to the summit of high and rocky Hathig Claw on a night when he knew the gods would be there. Hathig Claw is far in the stony desert beyond Hathig, for which it is named and rises like a rock statue in a silent temple. Around its peak the mists play always mournfully, for mists are the memories of the gods, and the gods loved Hathag Claw when they dwelt upon it in the old days. Often the gods of earth visit Hathag Claw in their ships of cloud, casting pale vapors over the slopes as they dance reminiscently on the summit under a clear moon. The villagers of Hatheg say it is ill to climb Hatheg Claw at any time, 
and deadly to climb it by night when pale vapors hide the summit and the moon. But Barzai heeded them not when he came from neighboring Ulthar with the young priest Atal, who was his disciple. Atal was only the son of an innkeeper and was sometimes afraid, but Barzai's father had been a landgrave who dwelt in an ancient castle, so he had no common superstition in his blood and only laughed at the fearful cotters. Barzai and Atal went out of Hatheg into the stony desert despite the prayers of peasants and talked of Earth's gods by their campfires at night. Many days they traveled, and from afar saw lofty Hatheg Claw with his aureole of mournful mist. On the thirteenth day they reached the mountain's lonely base, and Atal spoke of his fears. But Barzai was old and learned and had no fears, so led the way boldly up the slope that no man had scaled since the time of Sansu, who was written of with fright in the moldy Nakatic manuscripts. The way was rocky and made perilous by chasms, cliffs, and falling stones. Later it grew cold and snowy, and Barzai and Atal often slipped and fell as they hewed and plodded upward with staves and axes. Finally, the air grew thin and the sky changed color, and the climbers found it hard to breathe, but still they toiled up and up, marveling the strangeness of the scene and thrilling at the thought of what would happen on the summit when the moon was out and the pale vapors spread around. For three days they climbed higher, higher, and higher toward the roof of the world. Then they camped to wait for the clouding of the moon. For four nights no clouds came, and the moon shone down cold through the thin mournful mists around the silent pinnacle. Then on the fifth night which was the night of the full moon, Barzai saw some dense clouds far to the north. It stayed up with Atal to watch them draw near. Thick and majestic they sailed, slowly and deliberately onward, ranging themselves round the peak high above the watchers, and hiding the moon and the summit from view. For a long hour the watchers gazed whilst the vapors swirled and the screen of clouds grew thicker and more restless. Barzai was wise in the lore of Earth's gods and listened hard for certain sounds, but Atal felt the chill of the vapors and the awe of the night and feared much. And when Barzai began to climb higher and beckon eagerly, it was long before Atal would follow. So thick were the vapors that the way was hard, and though Atal followed on at last, he could scarce see the gray shape of Barzai on the dim slope above in the clouded moonlight. Barzai forged very far ahead, and seemed, despite his age, to climb more easily than Atal, fearing not the steepness that began to grow too great for any save a strong and dauntless man nor pausing at wide black chasms that Atal scarce could leap. And so they went up wildly over rocks and gulfs, slipping and stumbling, sometimes awed at the vastness and horrible silence of bleak ice pinnacles and mute granite steeps. Very suddenly, Barzai went out of Atal's sight, scaling a hideous cliff that seemed to bulge outward and block the path for any climber not inspired of Earth's gods. Atal was far below, and planning what he should do when he reached the place, when, curiously, he noticed that the light had grown strong, as if the cloudless peak and moonlit meeting place of the gods were very near, and as he scrambled on toward the bulging cliff and lit in sky, he felt fears more shocking than any he had known before. Then. Through the high mists, he heard the voice of unseen Barzai shouting wildly in delight. I have heard the gods, I have heard Earth's gods singing in revelry on Hathagla. The voices of Earth's gods are known to Barzai the prophet. The mists are thin and the moon is bright, and I shall see the gods dancing wildly on Hathagla that they loved in youth. The wisdom of Barzai hath made him greater than Earth's gods, and against his will their spells and barriers are as not. 
Barzai will behold the gods, the proud gods, the secret gods, the gods of Earth who spurn the sight of men. Atul could not hear the voices Barzai heard, but he was now close to the bulging cliff and scanning it for footholds. Then he heard Barzai's voice grow shriller and louder. The mists are very thin, and the moon casts shadows on the slope. The voices of Earth's gods are high and wild, and they fear the coming of Barzai the Wise, who is greater than they. The moon's light flickers as Earth's gods dance against it. I shall see the dancing forms of the gods that leap and howl in the moonlight. The light is dimmer, and the gods are afraid. Whilst Barzai was shouting these things, Atal felt a spectral change in the air, as if the laws of Earth were bowing to greater laws. For though the way was steeper than ever, the upward path was now grown fearsomely easy, and the bulging cliff proved scarce an obstacle when he reached it and slid perilously up its convex face. The light of the moon had strangely failed, and as Atal plunged upward through the mists, he heard Barzai the Wise shrieking in the shadows. The moon is dark, and the gods dance in the night. There is terror in the sky, for upon the moon hath sunk an eclipse foretold, and no books of men or of earth's gods. There is unknown magic on Hath and Claw, for the screams of the frightened gods have turned to laughter, and the slopes of ice shoot up endlessly into the black heavens, whither I am plunging. Hey, hey, at last in the dim light I behold the gods of Earth. And now Atoll, slipping dizzily up over inconceivable steeps, heard in the dark, a loathsome laughing, mixed with such a cry as no man else ever heard, save in the phlegathon of unrelatable nightmares, a cry wherein reverberated the horror and anguish of a haunted lifetime packed into one atrocious moment. The other gods, the other gods, the gods of the outer hells that guard the feeble gods of Earth, Look away, go back, do not see, do not see the vengeance of the infinite abysses, that cursed, that damnable pit, merciful gods of earth, I am falling into the sky. And as Atal shut his eyes and stopped his ears and tried to jump downward against the frightful pole from unknown heights, there resounded on Hath and Claw that terrible peal of thunder which awaked the good cotters of the plains and the honest burgesses of Hatheg and Mir and Ulthar, and caused them to behold through the clouds that strange eclipse of the moon that no book ever predicted. And when the moon came out at last, Atal was safe on the lower snows of the mountain without sight of Earth's gods or of the other gods. Now it is told in the moldy Nakatic manuscripts that Sansu found naught but wordless ice and rock when he climbed Hathed Claw in the youth of the world. Yet when the men of Ulthar and Nir and Hatheg crushed their fears and scaled that haunted steep by day in search of Barzai the Wise, they found graven in the naked stone of the summit a curious and cyclopean symbol fifty cubits wide, as if the rock had been riven by some titanic chisel, and the symbol was like to one that learned men have discerned in those frightful parts of the Nakatic manuscripts which are too ancient to be read. This they found. Barzai the wise they never found, nor could the holy priest Atal ever be persuaded to pray for his soul's repose. Moreover, to this day, the people of Ulthar and Nir and Hathig fear eclipses, and pray by night when pale vapors hide the mountain top and the moon. And above the mists on Hathig Claw, Earth's gods sometimes dance 
reminiscently, for they know they are safe, and love to come from unknown Kadath in ships of cloud and play in the olden way, as they did when earth was new and men not given to the climbing of inaccessible places. Thus concludes the other gods. We'll conclude this compilation with an unambiguously agreeable vengeance. I think we can all agree that those who would harm innocent animals are top of the list for getting whatever ill comes their way, and that is exactly the sort of malfeasance that received their comeuppance in this story, the cats of Ulthar. It is said that in Ulthar, which lies beyond the river sky, no man may kill a cat. And this I can verily believe as I gaze upon him who sitteth purring before the fire, for the cat is cryptic and close to strange things which men cannot see. He is the soul of antique Aegyptus and bearer of tales from forgotten cities in Maroa and Ophir. He is the kin of the jungle's lords and heir to the secrets of hoary and sinister Africa. The Sphinx is his cousin, and he speaks her language, but he is more ancient than the Sphinx, and remembers that which she hath forgotten. In Ulthar, before ever the Burgesses forbade the killing of cats, there dwelt an old cotter and his wife, who delighted to trap and slay the cats of their neighbors. Why they did this I know not, save that many hate the voice of the cat in the night and take it ill that cats should run stealthily about yards and gardens at twilight. But whatever the reason, this old man and woman took pleasure in trapping and slaying every cat which came near to their hovel. From some of the sounds heard after dark, many villagers fancied that the manner of slaying was exceedingly peculiar. But the villagers did not discuss such things with the old man and his wife of the habitual expression on the withered faces of the two, and because their cottage was so small and so darkly hidden under spreading oaks at the back of a neglected yard. In truth, much as the owners of cats hated these odd folk, they feared them more. Instead of berating them as brutal assassins, merely took care that no cherished pet or mouser should stray toward the remote hovel under the dark trees. When through some Unavoidable oversight, a cat was missed, and sounds heard after dark. The loser would lament impotently, or console himself by thinking, by thanking fate that it was not one of his children who had thus vanished. For the people of Ulthar were simple, and knew not whence it is, it is all cats first came. One day, a caravan of strange wanderers from the south entered the narrow cobbled streets of Ulthar. Dark wanderers they were, and unlike the other roving folk who passed through the village twice every year, in the marketplace they told fortunes for silver, and they bought gay beads from the merchants. What was the land of these wanderers none could tell, but it was seen that they were given to strange prayers, that they had painted on the sides of their wagons strange figures with human bodies and the heads of cats hawks, rams, and lions, and the leader of the caravan wore a headdress with two horns, a curious disc betwixt the horns. There was in this singular caravan a little boy with no father or mother, but only a tiny black kitten to cherish. The plague, the plague had not been kind to him, yet had left him this small furry thing to mitigate his sorrow. And when one is very young, one can find great relief in the lively antics of a black kitten. So the boy, whom the dark people called Menace, smiled more often than he wept, as he sate playing with his graceful kitten on the steps of an oddly painted wagon. On the third morning of the wanderer's stay in Ulthar, Menace could not find his kitten, and as he sobbed aloud in the marketplace, Certain villagers told him of the old man and his wife, 
and of sounds heard in the night. And when he heard these things, his sobbing gave place to meditation, and finally to prayer. He stretched out his arms toward the sun and prayed in a tongue no villager could understand, though indeed the villagers did not try very hard to understand since their attention was mostly taken up by the sky and the odd shapes the clouds were assuming. It was very peculiar, but as the little boy uttered his petition, there seemed to form overhead the shadowy nebulous figures of exotic things, of hybrid creatures crowned with horn-flanked disks. Nature is full of such illusions to impress the imaginative. That night, the wanderers left Olathar and were never seen again. And the householders were troubled when they noticed in all the villager there was not a cat to be found. From each hearth, the familiar cat had vanished. Cats large and small, black, gray, striped, yellow, and white, all. Old Cranon, the burgomaster, swore that the dark folk had taken the cats away in revenge for the killing of Menace's kitten and cursed the caravan and the little boy. But Nith, the lean notary, declared that the old cotter and his wife were more likely persons to suspect for their hatreds of cats was notorious and increasingly bold. Still, no one durst complain to the sinister couple, even when little Adol, the innkeeper's son, vowed that he had at twilight seen all the cats of Ulthar in that accursed yard under the trees, pacing very slowly and solemnly in a circle around the cottage, two abreast, as if in performance of some unheard of rite of beasts. The villagers did not know how much to believe from so small a boy, and though they feared that the evil pair had charmed the cats to their death, they preferred not to chide the old cotter till they met him outside his dark and repellent yard. So Ulthar went to sleep in vain anger, and when the people awaked at dawn, behold, <coughs> every cat <coughs> was back at his accustomed hearth, large and small, black, gray, striped, yellow, and white. None was missing. Very sleek and fat did the cats appear and sonorous with purring content. The citizens talked with one another of the affair and marveled not a little. Old Cranon again insisted that it was the dark folk who had taken them since cats did not return alive from the cottage of the ancient man and his wife. But all agreed on one thing, that the refusal of all the cats to eat their portions of meat or drink their saucers of milk was exceedingly curious, and for two whole days the sleek, lazy cats of Ulthar would touch no food but only doze by the fire or in the sun. It was fully a week before the villagers noticed that no lights were appearing at dusk in the windows of the cottage under the trees. Then the lean Nith remarked, no one had seen the old man or his wife since the night the cats were away. In another week, the burgomaster decided to overcome his fears and call at the strangely silent dwelling, as a matter of duty, of course. Though, in so doing, he was careful to take with him Shang the blacksmith and Thule the cutter of stone as witnesses. When they had broken down the frail door, they found only this, two cleanly picked human skeletons on the earthen floor, and a number of singular beetles crawling in the shadowy corners. There was subsequently much talk among the burgesses of Ulthar. Sath the Coronor disputed at length with Nith the lean notary, and Cranon and Shang and Thule were overwhelmed with questions, even little at all. The innkeeper's son was closely questioned and given a sweetmeat as a reward. They talked of the old cotter and his wife, of the caravan of dark wanderers, of a small menace and his black kitten, 
of the prayer of Menace and of the sky during that prayer, of the doings of the cats on the night the caravan left, and of what was later found in the cottage under the dark trees in that repellent yard. And in the end, the Burgesses passed that remarkable law which is told of by traitors in Hathig and discussed by travelers in Mir, namely that in Ulthar no man may kill a cat. Thus concludes the Cats of Ulthar. If you've gotten this far, thank you for listening to this entire collection. Now, ideally, you've long since drifted to sleep. And to those, I wish dreams full of wrongs righted and injustices punished. For those still awake, I beseech you to like the video and subscribe to the channel. It helps me to grow and continue reading these stories into the future. Now, if you have a favorite story you'd like to see read, Lovecraft or otherwise, please leave a comment, and I'll take a look at reading them. Now, ideally, they'll be in the public domain, as, you know, copyright and such, but let me know. I'll take a look. Now, with that, I wish you a good day, and I hope to see you back for a future story. Farewell. <laughs>